Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us this evening. If you uh, signed in, you are here for hand, wrist, and elbow conditions in the modern musician. I want to thank you for being here. I'm Dr. Robert Rode. I'm a partner with OrthoSensi, Orthopedics and Sports Medicine, and my background is in orthopedic surgery and hand, wrist, and elbow conditions. So, a couple things real quick. We're going to be talking about some very basic uh, concepts here today, and we're going to be talking about, in general, some of the general ideas and the different general problems that we may see people face when dealing with hand, wrist, and elbow, and the musicians, and the teachers, and the educators, and, and some of the concepts in staying healthy and, and just achieving your potential. So, Number one, thanks to everybody in my group, OrthoCincy, and with the Christ Hospital Health Network who helped make this possible. Great team and uh, behind the scenes and, and out front. So we work together with a number of different um, centers and Christ Hospital is one of them, and they've helped us to put this on. So everybody, again, welcome. You're all muted, so if you shout out to me, I'm not gonna hear it, but you can interact using the chat function the chat box, and there will be some question and answer. So hold on to those questions. At, at some point, we're going to start to request those. I may actually throw back to you all if there's a quick question or maybe a little trivia. So be ready if you wanted to throw something into the chat box. I have no disclosures or any other financial bias, just to go ahead and state that. So here's what we're going to talk about. Basically, a lot of different instruments and how they pertain to orthopedic and hand, wrist, and elbow issues, strings, guitars, percussion, brass, virtually everything. We're gonna talk a lot about prevention, but we'll touch on many of the symptoms and the different options for treatment. We will gear much of this talk to musicians, but educators, physical therapists, athletic trainers, and other um, people who are just very interested in music. You might be a parent of a musician. You might be a, a musician doing your second act in retirement or you might be a teenager who's really excelling and, and interested as well. I'm gonna present a few case examples and then we'll do some Q and A as I mentioned. So let's dive in. You know, in the last 20 years, the advent of social media and internet connections have really changed the awareness of hand, wrist, elbow injuries and some of the people we follow or listen to. Here's a little blurb from uh, Rolling Stone, you know, back in the day, the one and only Eddie Van Halen was having a difficult time with his sort of dizzying technique as a guitarist. He was having some thumb arthritis, ended up having surgery. And what do you know? If you logged in and did a Google search or looked at your internet feed, you found out Eddie Van Halen had thumb surgery. Likewise, Jack White of the White Stripes, he had an accident, broke his finger, needed to have surgery. So what did Jack White decide to do? Well, he live streamed it. He had a video of it. Now, I don't live stream my hand surgeries, but the point being, there's a much more general knowledge of things that can go well, things that can go bad, and we're much more aware, and we can Google, we can YouTube, we can really search for a whole lot of other good, bad, or indifferent um, knowledge. But let me tell you just a little bit about myself. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I actually am from this area. When I was growing up here in Cincinnati, I would say that there were two it seemed diverging interests. I was very interested in music. I was very interested in medicine. And I think as the years have gone by, I would say that they aren't that different. There's a lot of overlap, a lot of crossover. But locally, I think now I have a great appreciation. There was an incredible strength and wealth of education and opportunities here in town. I, I should give a shout out to some, some pretty legendary teachers and people who helped shape me from Steve Strider to Joe Gaudio to Rick Van Mater to Dick Jensen, people I studied with mostly in the percussion world. But, you know, a lot of people in this area maybe take for granted the level of education, training, and then um, high standards in this region. The local resources are incredible. Um, also here in town with the CCM and education opportunities, think about Youth Symphony Orchestra, and other jazz ensembles, and so on, we have a lot of people studying at a very high level. We have a lot of people teaching at a high level, and thus we're going to have a lot of people that may have interest in getting some help or dealing with a challenge. 
I'll also give a little throw out to people who aren't here in Cincinnati and listening or tuning in from a remote location. Cincinnati has traditionally been an interesting, um, ideal place for a lot of musicians who are notable to kind of hide out, hang out, and do good work. Um, you don't even have to type into your chat function if you're about my age. You know who that is. That's Peter Frampton. He lived in the same village with me and was bringing all sorts of world-renowned musicians to his home and was recording here in Cincinnati. He's but one of a number of different musicians. I don't know that anyone has any difficult recognizing Bootsy Collins, also very influential in the community, um, also a local Cincinnatian. Um, some of these other individuals, if you can tell us you know who they are, you can throw in the chat box who that is. Um, but these are also well-known local musicians. I happen to serve on the board with the bassist there on the left. Um, other musicians who may be from other cities, but tour the world and yet make Cincinnati area their home. I don't know that everybody recognizes each of them. Uh, some of them even have partnered with Taylor Swift and other musicians around the world, also with very significant roots here in Cincinnati. Um, so bottom line, we have a wealth of education resources. We have a wealth of performers. And with that comes a lot of people with coming down with some issues. We're going to start, though, in my experience, with one of the most common areas that I will see a musician, and that's stringed instruments, from upright string bass to cello, violin, viola, and, of course, guitar. When we use some terms here, some of these are geared towards other physicians tuning in, some for therapists, and I'll try to make it pretty basic. So tendinopathy is by far the most common issue and challenge that my stringed instrument performers will face. Tendinopathy means an overuse. You're using a certain muscle and tendon group and the tendon gets stressed or strained and it suffers. And sometimes it can hurt, sometimes it can swell. And we use the term tendinopathy. It is usually in general managed with rest, therapy and technique. And I will frequently work with a stringed instrument musician to sit down with one of our specialists in hand therapy to look, listen, even observe them with their instrument in hand and see what are they doing with posture, with technique? What is the whole kinetic chain of their arm from the shoulder on down? And we'll use the therapist, especially in times of difficulty. In my practice, what I will see is oftentimes a performer of many ages, different age groups around time of audition, uh, senior recital, or in times of performance, and really heavy uh, repetition and rehearsal and auditions. And so we will see a lot of flare-ups of some muscle and tendon overuse conditions. In addition, we'll go through concepts, and many of the educators here are not going to be at all unfamiliar with in being champions of frequent rest periods allowing a student, a performer, a musician who's ramping up to still have a period of rest, really warming up and stretching frequently. As I move forward in my career in orthopedic surgery, I found the commonalities with team sports, field sports, that's athletics. Well, we think of music as a performance athlete, and some of these common themes will carry over. Athletes on the field warm up, they stretch, and so too do we need to emphasize this with our performance athletes. The, the musicians need to have good warm-up techniques, stretching, and overall good tone. We also champion the concept of rehearsal or performance holidays, just like an athlete, so you have a time to recover. One other thing that maybe doesn't get talked about as much is I really emphasize the whole person overall physiologic conditioning. I really want our musicians and performance athletes to have really good endurance, um, health, and overall conditioning. It is a lot easier to get better at music if you're in extremely good shape. We also really shy away from purposefully playing through pain. Sometimes we're gonna have some episodes where it doesn't feel perfect, but we are not going to try to play through pain as a basic concept or tenet. And then we get creative. A stringed instrument musician has sometimes the ability to experiment with the musician's neck width, the instrument's thickness, or even different strings. So these are some initial kind of concepts. 
within the stringed instrument group, guitar is something that I interface a lot with my patients. We will see a lot of guitarists in the office. A lot of people play guitar for their overall health and enjoyment or professionally. And I have a great deal of both in my practice. I will see patients who play guitar who have a very good, difficult challenge with carpal tunnel syndrome. And I'll make a distinction. It's not that carpal tunnel syndrome is caused by somebody playing guitar. It's that one you have maybe from multiple factors, nerve compression at the wrist causing numbness in the fingers, symptoms of carpal tunnel syndrome. We're going to find that amplified or accentuated by actions of playing guitar, especially in the left hand. Um, a guitarist who picks frequently may feel that as well on the right hand. But generally speaking, the left hand for a right-handed guitarist will probably see a lot of those symptoms earlier. Again, not necessarily caused by playing guitar. Don't want to give that impression. But we will be on the lookout with our students, with our patients, and with our colleagues for numbness in the hand. We don't just um, pass that over. We pay attention to that. That is something that would bring you to see a, a medical professional to have it checked out. I mentioned earlier some uh, caveats with other guitarists. Eddie Van Halen, who had arthritis in the thumb, developed a fair amount of discomfort. Now, we think about some of the ways he played guitar, different chord forms and ways and techniques he would play, and his thumb would really um, suffer with arthritis with some of the different techniques. And in some cases, there are some ways that we can alter the guitar we use or find one with a different neck width, different softer strings, or we can change our style to a, basically just accommodate some arthritis. In more severe cases where we cannot manage conservatively, we will consider some surgeries for thumb arthritis. And certainly we don't jump to that. It's after conservative care has failed. But those are some issues that we see a lot with guitar. Other issues, and maybe we don't think of this as often, but we get fingertip injuries with guitarists, just like other sports. And maybe the, the photos here are a little bit fun, but it reminds us that a lot of our guitarists deal with irritation in the fingertips on both hands, obviously from strumming and picking on, on the dominant hand, but also on the left hand from playing chords. And we need to have thick calluses for guitar playing. But if we start to get splits in our skin, or if we have chronically dry skin, one technique that as trainers and therapists or educators we can use sometimes is uh, some of the sort of super glue, if you will, the medical grade dermabond or surgiseal. And oftentimes when I have uh, musicians who are on the road or touring, they will carry some dermabond so that when they get skin splits, we don't look like Pete Townsend here with a little bit of a, a bloody hand. So let's also talk about what happens when you do develop some widespread arthritis and, and, I, and we can't just magically make everything perfect. I emphasize modifying, experimenting. Sometimes I'll have patients who have really significant widespread arthritis in the hands. And, and the reality is we just can't make it all go away. But if you experiment and keep an open mind and try new things with your instrument, you can let the music come to the musician and let comfort dictate some examples. When finger joints don't bend like they used to, using a slide, using some type of a bottleneck like Stevie Ray Vaughan or Bonnie Raitt can allow you to be creative, try something new, and still allow that arthritic finger to modify and allow it to participate. A couple concepts on just being creative. Let me get into uh, another common area of music that I see, and that's percussion musicians. Um, something I grew up in, and when I say percussion, I don't just mean uh, playing drum set. I also mean timpani, mallets, um, accessory percussion, Latin percussion instruments. I don't know if anyone can identify the, the drummer here in this picture in the chat box, but I would tell you that not everybody in the world needs to have, you know, 50 drums and cymbals. But I guess perhaps Neil Peart deserves to have that. Nobody tells Neil Peart how many drums or cymbals is too much. But I would say this, ergonomically, if you're going to be successful, you want to really put some time and thought into the ergonomics of your stool height, the placement of your most important cymbals, drums, and are you going to be straining your shoulder, your elbow, your wrists, because the 
position and the kinematics of your arms is just over and over causing a bit of aggravation. So I'll really point to the ergonomics and your setup and your posture at the end of a long performance, shoulders hunch forward, the neck is lurched back, the neck, the shoulders, the arms, everything's under a lot of strain. So think about the ergonomics and how you play best. Um, we aren't going to criticize Neil Peart, but that can really wear on a drummer. And then when we talk about form and style, there's a couple different schools of thought and the educators know that traditional grip and matched grip are very different. We will see in my office a lot more ulnar or pinky sided wrist injuries with the older style or traditional grip. And on the left on your screen, you'll see a, a drummer playing on a practice pad with a traditional grip, often with the left hand in that posture versus on the right side, a matched grip. I would say biomechanically, the motion with a matched grip is a little easier on the kinetic chain up the arm, elbow, shoulder. It's a little more balanced, but if we think back historically, I think there's kind of a history of pipe and drum crews and the, the, the drums slung off to the side and the traditional grip may have been facilitating that position. Nowadays, modern um, drum corps will have the drums kind of positioned right in front, they will still, from a style standpoint, often use a traditional grip. But when dealing with wrist issues, being able to go to a matched grip is probably a real value for a lot of your percussionists. Again, some of it's style, some of it's the way you were taught, but I see a lot more wrist and forearm issues with the older style traditional. I'm also a big believer in trying different drumsticks. We have very traditional drumsticks on the left. We can have hot rods, bricks, brushes, a lot of different types of drumsticks for different purposes, different sounds. But as we get some um, musicians who are going through a difficult time, I'll have them recover and get healthy by using some dampening uh, style. So I'm a big fan of the hot rods. I think they have a really nice sound for some things and we can take a little of the load off. It's like wearing running shoes sometimes compared to dress shoes, but um, every drummer is gonna have a style and a sound that they want. But having a, a sort of a tool chest of different options is smart for the modern drummer. Let me turn the focus now to totally different area. That would be brass musicians, brass instruments. And one of the things that's gonna be different here for brass musicians is is effectively shouldering the load. A lot of brass musicians have one difference than the others, and that is you're carrying a heavy instrument. Whether you have a euphonium or you've got a trombone, think about that. You're supporting the weight. And if you look in at this picture, you're going to see in the left hand here, this trombone musician is has a, a little hook for his thumb, and there's going to be a positioning that's going to take a little strain on the on the, the left hand. Of course, the right hand is on the slide, but there's a different need and um, function for each hand. When people have some arthritis in their hand, and by and large, trombone players come to me when they have thumb arthritis. And this musician, I don't think anybody will be able to know who this musician is in the chat function, but this musician has found with help an option. We can use a supportive dynamic thumb brace to help hold and position that. Actually, I'll, I'll blow the cover. That's my mother. She's a wonderful, talented musician, and she's able to play very, very well at trombone with a thumb spike of brace. So therapists, athletic trainers, um, educators, that's another option there. I think that the trombone musicians are able to adapt pretty well. Um, and I think that some splinting on the offhand can be really helpful. So some overall points thus far. We always want with our patients, with therapy, to maintain that instrument-specific motion, whether it's a violinist, a percussionist, et cetera. You've got to be able to protect that at a comfortable level. I find working with my specialist in hand therapy is key. I will often mandate that the patient bring the instrument to therapy and I think that helps the therapist to look at the ergonomics, look at the posture, look at 
how could we do workarounds and tweak without critically altering the abilities of the, the patient and musician? And then I'm going to spend a little moment here talking about the young patient. And I think every educator out here understands there's an interesting dynamic. In some cases, with a stage mom or dad, we understand. We've all seen it. And this is like the field athletics and other sports that we deal with in sports medicine and orthopedics. These are some pretty motivated, hardworking, and, 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 and really tough performers or athletes. But there is an enormous amount of pressure, anxiety. There's definitely, you know, some intensity and expectations that they're dealing with. And I think that's important. And we need to make sure that these young patients or performers have, like we talked about, some rest periods. We sadly don't have near as much research on the young musician as we do on young athletes. And some emerging research I like to extrapolate from. And so if we will do a crossover and think about what we've learned scientifically about young athletes, sometimes super specializing at a young age, and we've all seen that in music, of course, we find that we can say that we would like to strive for two rest periods or rest days per week. So if you're a soccer player, a gymnast, it would be ideal if that young athlete can take two days off a week. Same with a young violinist, a young pianist, a young percussionist. So not always possible during audition times or performance weeks, but if you can get two rest days, very healthy for the rest of the body. Secondly, there is a corollary in young uh, sports specialization. We find that there's some good data emerging that if you take the child's age, let's say they're 10 years old, generally speaking, that's about the level of hours per week that it's probably approximately safe to participate. So if you're a 15-year-old and you're practicing more than 15 hours a week, that might be pushing the envelope. General concept, not fast and hard and true, but, but it's a general concept to think of. And as an educator, as a trainer, as a physical therapist, those are some guidelines that are nice to be able to share. And I also really emphasize in sports and in musicians with any of these athletes, performance athletes alike, is... Don't super specialize. Have some, some multiple activities. So have some other things that you do. When you have a day off, go play tennis. Go for a jog. Uh, participate in, in other activities so that you have multiple outlets. I think that's a healthy concept. Um, just a fun fact, in, in the, you know, the last few decades, DJs also became a part of my practice. And although it's changed a fair amount, I would also see some, some wrist injuries and we call that sometimes dart throwers motion with uh, DJs. For some of the therapists who are taking care of these musicians who are spending a lot of time DJing, look for ulnar-sided wrist injuries as well. Just kind of a fun fact that's a little bit different than when I was growing up. So one of the things that I'll kind of um, emphasize is the concept of maintaining good core stability for every one of our musicians. Now, for adults, a lot of us enjoy Pilates, and I am a huge proponent of Pilates as a good way for people to stay in great shape, good endurance, and core stability. And so a lot of my musicians, I'll have work with therapists who are skilled at teaching and training and treating uh, using Pilates as one of their um, key fundamental elements. And if we think about some of the stringed instrument musicians who were taught at an early age about Alexander technique and other, this is really what we're talking about, is having a strong foundation in core, and then with a strong core and great endurance, then everything flows down the kinetic chain of the shoulders, elbows, forearms, wrists, down to your fingers, but it all starts at the core. And so we don't want to let the core be overlooked. Our young musicians, also can start at a very early age working on core stability and establishing a good home routine, home program. It doesn't necessarily mean at the age of 10, you're running to work on a, a reformer or a Cadillac, but you can do a Pilates and core exercise program at home as well. So that's a really important tenet that I'd like to hit home. So I've gone through a bunch of different things talking about musicians. Let me go through some case examples. 
I'm hoping that will be helpful. And people can start putting together perhaps some ideas on questions. So all the patients here have given my approval, given their approval for me to present in medical situations. So we'll give a few examples and why it was important to understand their musical side. So here's a 50 year old pianist and a very talented accompanist. She fell, injured her left wrist and had, for those of you who are skilled at looking at x-rays, you know, a, a pretty complicated uh, distal radius fracture. So the major bone going down from the elbow down towards the thumb. This is a fracture at risk for not being able to hold up in a good position. It is also something that presented a problem as she was accompanying with some very significant recitals and competitions. So she had a lot on her shoulders. Here, the decision to go in emphatically or definitively and stabilize that fracture was an important consideration. Here, we did surgery, stabilizing from the inside that fracture in best possible position and allowing with enough internal stability that she could get back and do reasonable activities and here's a picture of her effectively a week out from surgery, and she was already able to accompany lightly. I'm not saying everyone can do that, but this allowed her to quickly get back and accompany for her uh, planned performances and uh, auditions. This example really, I think, highlights understanding that while some people might do just fine in a cast, might do just fine with other techniques, understanding her need to get back very quickly with some support and some comfort was, was of paramount importance. I also can sometimes urge them to use uh, lighter action keys uh, when transitioning back to go a little bit easier on the hand. Another example was a 55-year-old guitarist and somewhere else, maybe outside of our town, he had had a bicep surgery at the elbow where he ruptured his biceps and he had a technique where they used a type of a button to reattach it. And unfortunately, one of the things that can happen there is you can develop way too much bone formation that overtakes the two bones, the radius and the ulna, that will rotate the arm. Unfortunately, when he came to me, he had just bought a really wonderful guitar he loved, but he couldn't rotate his left arm. His left arm was fixed in pronation. The palm was down. For the guitarists on this webinar, you're sitting there thinking, how in the heck would he be able to play guitar unless he was playing electric slide guitar if his arm was pronated? So he was in a conundrum, couldn't play guitar, elbow was in a locked position. The x-ray may not mean as much to people, but if we look there between the radius and the ulna, you'll be seeing some bone that's bridging between the two and creating effectively a block between turning the forearm. So challenging situation, challenging surgery, but the most important thing to this gentleman was his ability to get back and be able to play guitar. And so we did a challenging surgery with a lot of risks, but I made him promise to me if I did it and he did well, he'd bring his guitar in and play for me in the office. So the good news is he did bring in the guitar. And as you look at his left hand, as he's playing an open chord, he needed to be able to turn his hand up, what we call supination, to be able to play. Thank goodness. I mean. He had a very, very good result, played a song for me in the office. That ability for him to return to supination was more crucial than anything. He needed to be able to position as a guitarist. And in fact, you know, knowing what he knew with his situation, he might have even been better off without the non-dominant left elbow bicep surgery if he had understood the risks. But point being, that was very specific to a guitarist and an important um, caveat to understand. A number, uh, number three in the case example is a, a fun one. A very nice gentleman, a uh, well-known clarinetist who teaches in master classes and performs. And he had a condition that many people in Cincinnati have called Dupuytrens. It seems to be more genetic, familial, a lot of Northern European ancestry. Suffice it to say that under the skin, the webbing in the hand will contract in some patients and start to bring the fingers down. He had one surgery with a different doctor. Unfortunately, he had the all too common recurrence, nobody's fault, but recurrence. And he could not appropriately get his hand around the clarinet. He was really struggling to teach, demonstrate and give master classes. It was really frustrating to him. He admitted to me that he felt depressed. He was canceling master classes. He had his favorite 
um, valuable clarinet he sold. And one of the questions was, uh, was it worth it to undertake an aggressive surgery? And his point was that he was losing his interest in a lot of the things so important to him. So we agreed to do a revision surgery and not for gore, but I, I want to show the importance of how aggressive we needed to be for this revision surgery, showing that we took a lot of scar tissue out of his hand. But at the end of surgery, I was able to thankfully fully extend the finger. Now, this is a progressive disorder. In no way am I promising that this is a forever um, result. But it did allow him, and here at three and nine, at nine months, I should say, it allowed him to have excellent motion of his hand. He's another one that I said, I'll do the surgery if you only will come back and play me something with your clarinet. And he brought an old childhood clarinet into the office and played. And thankfully, you know, his affect brightened. He was telling jokes. He was funny. And clearly, this was so meaningful to him. I think some takeaway points. Your musicians really, there's a, a crucial kind of psychosocial and identification with the instrument and your ability to perform. And so as medical caregivers, understanding that was critical. Some other doctors might say to him, just deal with it. Or even some people would suggest amputation. But for him, his identity was in his ability to teach, convey his knowledge and his expertise with clarinet. And then a final one was a young person. And this is an interesting case where there were there was a time factor, 16 years old, but a, a, an amazing performer and plays in a, um, a bluegrass band. And his left little finger at the proximal phalanx had what many people who look at x-rays will note to be a challenging fracture and not unusual in a young person. Unfortunately, I would usually plan and schedule and then perform a surgery, maybe put wires in to hold it, but he didn't have that time. They were looking at him and his group for potential um, music deals. And he had people literally within 24 hours, they were going to be assessing and maybe deciding if they would be um, a band and a musician that people would like to uh, invest in. So after talking with him and his parents, we did um, admittedly not the full treatment, but we did a closed reduction and splinted him and with full knowledge that he could lose a little bit of motion, but with the ability that I could splint him and he could go perform in front of some music industry uh, leaders. And um, his family was kind enough to share a picture. He was able to bypass that little finger. He was a smart, smart player, was able to perform very soon after that procedure in the office. And, was, and, 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 I, and I hope that the performance went well, but he was successfully able to do that. He was very adaptable, a very talented musician. He was good enough to be able to bypass his small finger and still perform. But the point there was, I was up front with them that there were some aspects that he could lose a little bit of finger extension, but he needed to be able to have flexion and he needed to be able to perform at a, at a very early level. And thankfully, the outcome was excellent for him. But again, as a stringed instrument musician playing mandolin and banjo, he had to be able to flex the finger and he had to be able to do it soon. So a couple last thoughts. Number one, we really try to manage most of these issues. I am not out looking to do operations on hardly any musician. It happens, but we're trying to manage and use conservative prevention. If an injury or a condition pops up, we find often that I will encourage that musician to bring one's instrument when we go to therapy or if I'm gonna look at them. I am not a fan of telling people to play through pain. I don't think that that serves them very much. And we also want to emphasize paying attention to the entire limb and core strength, core conditioning. I think those are some things that need to be uh, take home points for the educators, the teachers, performers, and therapists and other physicians. So I've gone through a lot and I, I hope it's been at least interesting or somewhat helpful. Um, there is information here uh, in terms of if you had somebody you wanted to refer or needed to make an appointment, but now would be the time where if somebody had some real insight or wanted to share something with us or a question that we could um, take some questions. So I'm gonna try to look here through my bifocals. So here it says, I'm in my fifties and recently started to play the guitar. Congratulations, I love that, I'm impressed. I, that's the greatest thing you could do. 
Is there anything I can do to help prevent potential injuries? Well, I think we've gone through a few of those. Number one, start slow, set yourself up for success. Don't think that you are going to be all of a sudden a virtuoso overnight. Set yourself up for some little gains a little bit at a time and don't be embarrassed to get a good experienced teacher. Having somebody to help you through some shortcuts and show you some good technique is gonna be helpful. And remember what I was saying, have good core strength, have good posture and be in good shape. Um, and be willing to experiment and maybe try different guitars too. I've got a number of different guitars. I'm never gonna be half the guitarist my kids are, but I do know certain guitars respond better in my hands. And so if you find the guitar that feels good, you have a trusted teacher or a peer that helps you and you stay in good shape, then I think that you can ramp things up and set yourself up for little victories and not think that you're gonna become fantastic overnight. Here's another question. In certain sports, children are sometimes advised to limit participation until they are more developed. Are there suggested limitations for young musicians too? Love the question. I think that in general, if there is a student who's able to read and they can read music, involving in music has excellent research, proven um, benefits to young students in terms of their brains and their development and building confidence. And if you know you're good at something, you know you're really good at flute or at drums, then that really builds on a lot of other factors in, in growth. We did touch on a couple things in terms of limitations. And I think that as long as the child is thriving, is enjoying what they're doing, then I think that it's, in, it's wonderful to encourage it. Remember the tenets that I brought up in general of a couple rest days a week. And if that child is only seven, we certainly wouldn't want to push past seven hours a week of performance or interaction. But those are um, general rules. So remember the age of the musician, the number of hours per week. And I'm not a fan of um, hovering over them as they rehearse or practice. It has always been my feeling in my family, and I've been blessed with a family who supported learning music, but not to hover and to berate students and family members, but to let them enjoy it and know that they're good at what they're doing really helps with their development. What instruments have been found to cause the most injuries and ailments? I'll, that's a great question. I'm gonna think of that in a couple parts. I find in my practice, and I'm not sure why, I see a lot of guitarists, and I think it's because we are active and living longer, and we are all getting some ailments and arthritis, and we still want to play music, and I'll see guitarists that will get some frustrations. We can work through most of them, but I see a lot of that. It doesn't mean guitar is causing it. It's just that I want them to be able to play guitar and bring some, some satisfaction and enjoyment to their lives, but there are some things we got to work around. On the other hand, some stringed instrument athletes, musician athletes, as I say, I find some, some difficult problems. Violin, which I have a sister who's a tremendous violinist, but we know violinists have a posture with their head and neck that can be a challenge. And so we will sometimes see violinists start to get numbness in the hand. I will say that that's one that I really stand up and take notice. If they're coming to me as a violinist, violist, and that neck may be linked to numbness in the hand, those are ones I would encourage everyone to at least get checked out. So that's another instrument that I think that, although not as common, I think that I really take a lot of notice for that. Um, final question. For rest periods, how much rest is typically required? I think that's tough. I think that a rest period, it can range from, for some people, just a few days, but for many people, it can almost be like an off season. So if you are really playing hard and you've been playing for weeks and weeks and weeks, I like to think about taking several weeks off if you're really dealing with some tendinopathies specifically. If it's burnout, I'm not going to be your expert at that, but if it's muscles and tendons getting really sore and we're in a vicious cycle, I like people to take a few weeks off, multitask, cross train, go do something different, 
play the piano instead of violin, go jogging, work on some other activity, stay physically fit, but sometimes take a few weeks off. Hard when you're a developing musician or you've got auditions scheduled, but I think that that can be a wonderful way to at least give your body a break. Well, listen, I've enjoyed this. I hope that there's been some value for people out there. I want to thank again the entire Ortho Cincy team and Christ Hospital team that's helped make these webinars possible. If you're one of the folks who knows someone who wanted to register but was not able to be here because you yourself had marching band or you've had a theater performance, we have an opportunity that through the registration process, you should get an email with a link to be able to view later. So um, thank you again for your attention. And if you ever have the need to reach out to us, we welcome seeing you in the office, but we hope that you can go out and enjoy your musicality at your best potential.